Now we get on to the presentation for tonight. And tonight we are very privileged to have John Mulcahy uh, able to come to us through the wonders of uh, the internet from uh, Scotland uh, and uh, talk to us about Room EQ Wizard. John is a resident in North Scotland and uh, has had more than 40 years experience in development of high technology products and the management of technology companies. These include sectors ranging from avionics and automotive electronics to high-end audio broadcast and consumer electronics. In the audio arena, John was the technical director of TAG McLaren Audio, responsible for the development of McLaren's range of home theatre components. However, tonight, we consider he is the author of the REW, or Room EQ Wizard, which is a very, very useful free acoustic measurement and analysis package. It's a very versatile tool for room acoustic measurement, as well as loudspeaker and equipment measurements, and interfaces with other equipment, which makes it a very powerful tool. Um, John is intending tonight to explain what he's doing, but he'll cover the, the package, the tools and the features. And he, he will also give us a glimpse of the roadmap for REW and hopefully we'll invite questions and suggestions on the direction its future development could take. Hello, John, and welcome to the Melbourne AES section. Well, thank, thank you. Give him a big round of applause. Unmute and give him a round of applause. <laughs> and then mute again. Mute. Thank you, John. Yeah, might, might be early for applause. Wait, wait and see if you like the presentation or not first. Oh, more applause. I'll mute now. Where's my mute button? Okay. Um, well, as, as Graham said, I think that the aim today is I'll give you a bit of an overview of what REW is and what features it's got, um, a bit of history about how it came to be in the first place, and then we can talk about what's the, what the plans are for the future of REW and what might come next. And I'm quite keen to get some suggestions for that as well. So always pleased to hear where you think it should go and what route it should take. Um, I will look to keep an eye on the chat box as we go through. So if you've got questions, pop them in there and you can either deal with them as we go or I'll pick them up uh, at the end of the session. So without further ado, let's share the screen with that one. And hopefully you can all see that now and I'll, I'll start to go through the presentation. So let's begin with what it is. Um, so it's a bit of free software for measuring really all kinds of audio, audio equipment and acoustic environments. It's been around a little while now. Um, I'm much older than I look, honestly. So it started around about 2004. It uses off the shelf audio interfaces. So you don't need any custom hardware to, to make use of REW. And it is a, a cross-platform application. There, there are builds for Windows, for Mac OS, for Linux, um, most of the, the modern versions of those software. And it's cross-platform partly because it's written in Java, which has a, a runtime environment that can live on, on different platforms. There's, there's a fair amount of code in it. There's about 270,000 lines that I've written. And there are a few libraries in there that, that add to the total. And of course, there's the Java runtime itself, which is fairly massive. And the, the package aims to be used by quite a broad range of, of people, whether they're complete novices to audio or acoustic measurement or, or indeed audio professionals like yourselves. Um, you can tell me at the end whether it's, it meets any of those aims. And although it's free, there is a, a pro version since last year, which is adding the capability to measure simultaneously from multiple microphones, which is not something that the, the average user is likely to need, but can be quite handy if you're, if you're an acoustics professional. So I'll, I'll give a bit of a tour of the features. I, I won't go into too much detail on them. Um, if there's something you, you want a bit more information on, then, then just ask me. Um, but I'll, I'll talk through each piece in turn, starting here with the, the measurement side of things. So REW does impulse response measurement using exponential sign sweeps. So for measuring the, the characteristics of the acoustic environment or the bit of equipment that you've, you've got connected to it. And it can do impedance measurements also, again, with exponential sign sweeps using fairly simple arrangement, just a, a series resistor essentially, 
that senses the current, senses the voltage and, and works out the impedance. It has a spectrum analyzer, come RTA, which incorporates distortion analysis. So you can look at THD, intermod, um, total distortion plus noise and so on. And it also has some step sign measurement capabilities. So versus level or frequency for THD or step level intermod or step level multi-tone total distortion plus noise. And I'll talk a little bit more detail about each of those as we go along. So let's move on. Let me just make sure whether I can see the chat box here. Chat, there we go. All right, so, so this is the, the dialogue you get when you want to make a, a measurement in REW. And on the left-hand side, there are some features about the measurement itself. So SPL is just a, a convenient term for the essentially transfer function measurement. You can set the name of the measurement, add some notes, select the frequency range over which you want to measure. Um, there's the, the measurement level you want to take out. There are a couple of protection mechanisms. So you can abort measurements if there's heavy clipping or if you exceed a certain SPL threshold, they're, they're just kind of safety checks in case someone accidentally set a gain far too high, trying to avoid uh, damaging either your hearing or, or whatever equipment you're measuring. And there's a little box in the corner, which is a, a live preview of the, the levels coming in on the microphone. And on the right hand side of the dialogue are configurations for the measurement itself. So it's a sweep measurement. There is a button there for noise measurements in the future, but I've not implemented that yet. You can select the, the length of the sweep. There are a couple of options for timing references. Um, loopback is a fairly common method of timing reference an output to an input. But there's a, an increasing use of USB microphones, um, particularly amongst the, if you like, the, the amateur audio community. And those, of course, don't have an additional input for a loopback. So, REW has what I've called an acoustic timing reference. So it'll send a high frequency chirp from one channel at the beginning of the measurement and use that to synchronize and act as a reference for the, the subsequent capture. Um, playback can be either from REW itself, so straight through whatever interface you've got connected to the computer, or you can play back from file, which is probably useful if you're trying to measure a piece of equipment that you can't directly provide a, a signal to. Sample rates are selectable. You can make one measurement or multiple measurements. Multiple can be handy if you're making measurements on a turntable, for example, for polar responses. Um, and that's about it really for the, the impulse response measurement side of things. Nothing too, too dramatic about it. The impedance screen is, is very similar, a different color, just so that you, you don't forget that you're actually in the impedance mode. Uh, left-hand side is, is largely the same as for an impulse response. Um, on the right-hand side, there are a few changes. So impedance measurement has some um, calibrations to make sure you get an accurate result. So you do open circuit, short circuit, and reference calibration, um, as is common with much uh, impedance measuring instruments. But the combination of all three means you can get pretty precise results over a fairly broad range of impedances. So this is the spectrum analyzer screen, um, just showing the, the analysis of a, a 997 Hertz tone in that case. So in, in the box in the upper left, you can see the level of the tone. Span there is where the distortion, low pass and high pass limits have been set. Um, the levels and phases of the harmonics are, are analyzed and shown up there. And you've got the usual THD, THD plus N, and the various higher harmonics and noise levels are also indicated on that screen. You can save any of the spectrum analyzer uh, results as a, a measurement to, to look at in more detail later. And there's also a button on this screen to move on to the step sign side of things. Step measurements then. Um, there are, there are a few options in there. I've put a couple of the screens up there. So the, on the left-hand side, there's a THD versus frequency set of options. On the right-hand side, uh, intermod distortion versus level, um, in that case with a DIN stimulus. Oh, chat's back on. Woohoo. Um, 
in similar fashion to the uh, transfer function measurements, there are a couple of protection mechanisms, heavy clipping or distortion, uh, in case you need to abort a, a step measurement. And because step measurements can take a while, there is an option to pause the measurement while it's going. And you can also uh, go back and repeat one of the steps if there was something that interfered with a particular measurement. So this is what the REW window looks like when you've loaded a, well, in this case, a variety of measurements of different types. Um, the buttons at the top left are related to the measurements themselves. So you can save the whole group, uh, get rid of them all if you want to, open a new measurement, or the button on the far left there is to just start a, a new measurement. In the middle at the, the top of the window, there are a few tool related buttons. Uh, setting the impulse response windows and some of the other tools of REW, most of which I'll, I'll run through in a moment. And below that, there are selections for the, the different graphs that you have. So SPL and phase, um, fairly self-explanatory. There's a, a sort of overlay within this window, but there's a separate window for a wider range of overlays. And you can look at distortion, the impulse response, and so on and so forth. And the, the measurements themselves are in a, a sort of a card stack on the left-hand side, so you, you can go up and down through those or select them as you wish. Okay, first of the tools is the SPL meter, and um, it has the, the usual features of an SPL meter. You can measure SPL or LEQ or sound exposure level, uh, typical ACZ weightings, fast and slow um, filtering but it is a, a frequency domain measurement. And the reason for that is so that the calibration file of the microphone can be taken into account in producing the levels. Um, so it takes blocks of input data, usually about 8K blocks and performs the FFT of those and then calculates SPLs and so on from that. You can also log SPL data to file or to a separate graph window. So you can look at the, the history of SPL over time and that can actually spend multiple days if you want. So it'll log to a, a separate file for each day. Is a linear mic also available? I, I don't really know how to answer that question. Um, microphones are for the most part pretty linear. It's just the A, the a or C weighting curves that modify the spectral response. Um, well, there's a Z weighting as well, so. Yeah, okay. So Z is, is unweighted. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Signal generator. Um, test signals are always handy. So there's, there's quite a variety of them inside REW. I suppose there's always a bit of room for more if someone comes up with something that would be particularly useful that they don't find in there. You have the typical tones, so sine waves, square waves, um, windowed tone bursts of uh, various durations and, and shapes. There's a specific one there for the CEA 2010 tone burst, which is used for maximum SPL testing. Um, on the intermod side, there are dual tone and triple tone options, the usual standard ones plus uh, custom, so you can set uh, frequencies and ratios as, as you see fit. There are multi-tone um, signals, which have various options for spacing, so they can be linearly spaced. Uh, fractional octave, fractional decade, or the, the non-interharmonic distortion option, which aims to avoid the, the low order products of other tones when uh, setting the spacings. On the noise side, you have pink and white noise, of course, uh, whether they're random or periodic noise, and you can shape that as you see fit. So low and high pass filters can be applied. You can control the order of the filters and choose what range you want. There are also linear and logarithmic sweeps, and signals can be exported to WAV files in a variety of formats, from 16-bit PCM through to 32-bit float, and various durations. There is a, a basic oscilloscope inside REW, so that's a, a two-channel scope with an additional uh, math function channel. Um, what you see on there in the main window is the, the capture from one channel and at the bottom there's the, the capture buffer essentially. The scope uses sync interpolation if you're zoomed in enough to see the individual samples so you get a, a representative view of 
of the band limited capture of the, the device. And you can set cursors and thresholds, the, the usual kinds of things you get with a scope, positive or negative edge triggering, trigger hold off. I'm mean, nothing terribly remarkable, but hopefully most of the things you want to, to use if you need to capture some raw waveforms. A, a few miscellaneous tools really. So there's a uh, level meters. Um, you can change the units those show. So DBFS is shown there at the moment, but there could be voltage or SPL or DBU or whatever it is you actually need to see. You can arrange them horizontally or vertically as you see fit. Um, there's a frequency meter. So that it takes oversampled input data, um, looks at the transitions through the mean and uses then a, a form of interpolated reciprocal frequency counting with some statistical averaging to, to work out the frequency of the input signal. And that works down to about 10 Hertz or so, just because of the blocks of, of data that it works with. Um, I have looked at M noise as a test signal. So there's a question on the chat there. Um, the, I'm, I'm slightly disappointed that they don't provide a, an algorithmic means of, of generating the signal. You have to embed the entire wave file which is, is fairly bulky. Um, so I, I haven't dismissed it. And of course you, you can play it. And I, I appreciate there's interest in, in um, the characteristics of that signal for testing certain things. So I've, it's, it's on my rather lengthy to-do list to look at how best to integrate that, but I'm just reluctant to put a massive wave file into the, the build itself, just because it seems to add a lot of bulk to download for not necessarily a lot of benefit. But I'm aware of it and I am looking at it. And maybe one day they'll say, and by the way, here's how you generate it if you'd like to use it. You never know your luck. Um, the last little tool on there is just uh, interchannel gain and phase. Um, uh, so it's, it's handy if you want to check whether uh, the channels of uh, an amplifier have, have a decent gain and phase matching or not. Uh, that's why it was requested actually. Room simulator. So there is a, a basic room simulator in REW. It's, it's for cuboid spaces, um, essentially solutions to the wave equation. On the left-hand side there, you can see plan and elevation views of the space. Um, you can set the average surface absorptions for the, the different surfaces in the room, uh, dimensions, of course. And you can drag the positions of the speakers or the, um, the listening position around and see the response change live as, as you do that, just to get an idea of what's working and what's not. And you can display the responses to the, the sides, front and back and above and below the central mic position if you want and export the result to analyze it further as a measurement with magnitude and phase response. So you can have up to eight subwoofers in, in the simulator. It can be useful as a starting point when you're looking at positioning things, but there's really no substitute for, for actual measurements once you, you get to the final stages of that. So analysis features. Um, so I'll, I'll give a quick summary on this, these uh, next couple of slides, and then I'll go through a bit more detail on some of the analysis things. But most of the, the things you might expect to find, hopefully you'll, you'll find within REW, you get the magnitude and phase response, of course. Uh, the impulse response is there along with the envelope and the step response. There's a, a little tool that estimates impulse response delay. Um, that's by cross correlation with the minimum phase version of the, the impulse response. You can estimate minimum phase responses with or without tails on the response, uh, depending on what you think is appropriate. And once you've got that, then you can also look at the excess phase on the signal. Harmonic distortion is displayed, of course, uh, group delay. And there are a few of the ISO 3382 parameters available. So early decay time, the various RT60 measures, clarity and definition and center time. There's also a, a frequency domain RT60 measure. Um, I'll talk about that more in a, a minute. I appreciate that's not a, not a common thing, but it, it can be useful in certain situations. And there are various um, time frequency displays. So short-term Fourier transform, um, 
decay plots, waterfalls, burst decays, spectrograms, whether they're wavelet spectrogram. Um, so there was a question, I think that's about the room simulator, looking at the room and loudspeaker sources for the room simulator. So uh, the room simulator um, essentially is the solution to the, the, the wave equation for uh, rigid or somewhat lossy boundaries, uh, according to the absorption characteristic. And sources are treated as omnidirectional, although you can specify the uh, cutoff frequency for subwoofers and the, or the high pass frequency for speakers. Okay, let's look at a bit more of some of the analysis features. So you can do arithmetic on traces, um, the usual sum difference product, you can do the ratios. Uh, you can also do a, a regularized band limited inverse. So regularized there just means that in regions where the signal gets very small, you can add a small constant value to it to make sure that you don't uh, blow up the result essentially. Uh, response averaging is offered. So that's vector averages, RMS averages, and uh, dB averaging, averaging the actual dB values. That's sometimes useful when you're looking at EQ uh, compromises across multiple positions. There's a phase alignment tool, which is used for aligning mains and subs for the most part. So I'll cover that in a second. And you can also estimate the small parameters from the impedance measurements that have been made. So that accepts either sealed box added mass or dual added mass measurement methods. Um, it uses a, a Ritter 3PC motional impedance model. Um, that seems to give kind of the broadest compromise for the, the wide varieties of drive units that you might encounter. It seems to work fairly well. Uh, another impedance related feature is you can generate inductor and capacitor equivalent circuit component models. And what that does essentially is take the measurement of the, the actual device and come up with something that you could plug into a simulator that represents the losses that are inherent within it. There are filter calculation capabilities. Um, that's really harks back to the origins of, of REW and I'll, I'll talk more about that in a moment as well. And modal resonance analysis, which is a way of extracting the resonances that um, Com that essentially make up the response you've got. I did become a bit obsessed with modal resonance back in the sort of mid 2000s, which is why that's in there, um, for better or worse. I mean, it's just, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it later. I I'm not sure it was um, that fruitful in the end, but it was interesting. Uh, there was a question about a, a paper on using the wave equation. Um, there are some texts that, that cover that fairly well, and I'll dig one out and see if I can provide it later. All right, let's look at one of these tools. So the, the phase alignment tool. So this is essentially taking a measurement of, uh, for example, a main speaker and a subwoofer, which is what we've got on there, and looking at what you might do to gain, but principally to the delay of the signals to get a, a better phase match between the two through the, the handover between the, the subwoofer and the main, for example. And what you see on the graph is the cursor is at 40 hertz and REW has been asked to align the phase at the cursor. So it's come up with a delay figure for the sub, which will bring the phase into alignment. So you can either align the phase or align the slopes of the phases. The aligning slopes can be useful if it turns out that what you actually need to do is to invert the phase of one of them. It makes it a, a bit more obvious. So it's, um, it also allows you to just play around with the, the delays and the phases as you see fit, uh, have a look at what the resulting acoustic sum will be and see what compromise works best for, for your particular situation. The Thiel small parameters I mentioned before. So this is the, the dialog you use to configure that. Um, uh, it looks a bit complicated, but there isn't that much that the user needs to, to enter in fact. Um, you pick the measurement method up in the top left there. Uh, in this case, it's set up for an added mass measurement. Tell REW what the free air measurement was and what the, the added mass measurement was and the actual value of the mass. Um, that doesn't need to be quite precise if you're going to get a good result. Uh, 
you can give an estimate of the approximate DC resistance and then the effective area of the cone. And then essentially REW will do the, the curve fitting and work out the equivalent parameters for you. Um, in the top right there, you can see the parameters of the motion impedance model that, that best fit this particular measurement, the blocked impedance parameters, and for the, the more traditional TS, um, if you like the simplified view, then it works out what the parameters would be for that as well. And then down in the bottom, you get some of the more detailed um, uh, the QMS, QES, QTS, the VAS, that sort of thing, and also the, uh, the BL. And if we look at, yeah, so there's an example of uh, an impedance measurement. The red and green are the actual measured um, values and the, the black lines which are overlaying them are the model fit. And there's a question about what the, just if we go back, what beta is there in the uh, motion impedance model. And that's partly to, to deal with um, trying to, to match the behavior of the surround. Um, the, the actual characteristics of that can be rather nonlinear and beta is a parameter which helps to, to deal with that and get a better fit. Um, I think you'd be, you'd be best consulting um, some of the papers of Klaus Futrup and uh, Nud Thorberg and um, Jeff Candy has also done some work with Klaus on uh, particularly dual added mass measurements and some of the, the particular types of um, motion impedance model and how well they work. So there is, um, as ever, there's, there's a lot of good information in the AES papers. And if you do a bit of a search on there, I think you'll find um, quite a lot of uh, very rich material on that. So yeah, frequency domain RT60. Um, now, I, I appreciate this is a, a bit of an unusual thing. Um, you may not have come across it. Um, you may never want to come across it again. The, the, the problem I was having was RT60 using the, the, the normal uh, Schroeder integral and, and Lundeby's method for um, estimating the noise floor and so on uh, works very well. It, you know, it has a, a rich history and it, it's, it deserves its place in, in widespread acoustic usage. But when you want to look more precisely at narrower frequency bands, then the filtering becomes quite a problem. Essentially, the, the delay of the filter itself starts to overwhelm the actual delay of the room, and it becomes very difficult to separate those. Um, and so I thought that, well, if we move to the frequency domain, then filtering becomes no longer a problem. I can use brick wall filters in the frequency domain. I won't have any impact on the actual results. So I looked at using essentially the successive slices of a short-term Fourier transform of the impulse response and calculating the RT60 values from that by fitting a, an exponential decay plus noise to the, the sequence of slices. Um, it's, not, it's not entirely trivial. The, the shape of the, that waterfall plot there is heavily dependent on the shape of the, the left window, uh, which is used to make the short-term Fourier transform. And that left window itself becomes convolved with the changes in delay between the slices. So you need to take that into account. But once you do, you can get um, very accurate and highly selective RT60 measurements at high resolutions if, if you wish to to have it at a high resolution, there's a 12 octave view there. You could go up to 148 octave if you wanted. And that can be useful for pinpointing some of the individual frequencies and resonances, working out what their decays are so that you could more precisely target some tuned absorption, for example. Um, yeah. There is actually a, a fair amount on how that works and, and what it does and the comparisons with the conventional measurements in terms of its selectivity and the accuracy of the, the RT60 measurements and the, the help for REW, if you're enthusiastic enough to want to look at that. Uh, next up. There we go. Uh, a wavelet spectrogram. So there, there are a few uh, spectrogram views in REW. This is the wavelet view. It's um, 
enhanced or, or, or not enhanced, depending on your point of view, by a, a little bit of uh, 3D shading just to help identify some of the ridges in the plot. Those are optional. Um, the, the wavelet transform in that case is actually implemented by complex smoothing um, and using the essentially time shift properties of the FFT to, to work through the different slices. Okay, let's move on. Um, oh, so this is um, an example of the, the pro feature, the multi-input microphone. So this is a capture from 16 microphones simultaneously. You can see the, the average as the cyan trace, the span of the um, max and min across the multiple microphones is shown as a, a sort of underlay on the plot. And uh, you can adjust the, the averaging characteristics, the, the weightings, uh, align the individual SPLs if you want to. It's, it's handy for environments which are a bit difficult to capture in a, in a single uh, measurement. Um, the original development of that was actually for automotive applications, so measuring in science cabins. This is nice. Yeah, well, thank you. Glad to hear it. Uh, the EQ window. So, I mean, as, as you might guess from the, the name, that this is sort of the, the origins of REW. And what you see in there is a, a measurement in the darker red, um, some IR EQ filters, which are shown in the sort of cyan response, which REW has calculated to try and bring the response onto a target. And as we talk about the origins of, of REW, I'll explain a little bit about how that came about. But it's relatively straightforward. You can see on the right-hand side, you, you select the, the type of target you want, whether you want to add a, a particular room curve, as they call it, as some subjective uh, tonal shaping to that. Uh, you can decide whether or not you want any boost in the overall response, the frequency range it should operate over. And then REW will work out some filters for you and you can plug them into an EQ. Um, I wouldn't personally recommend it for full range use. Um, it does seem to be popular to do that. It's, I think it's best suited to dealing with some of the, the low frequency effects that are quite hard to manage by acoustic treatment in smaller spaces. Um, but yeah, it was, it was part of the history and I, I, I did quite enjoy it at the time. All right, so a little bit more about REW then and, and who uses it. And uh, it's a little bit trite perhaps, but essentially anyone who's interested in, in acoustic behavior or the behavior of a bit of audio equipment can use REW. It does try to be reasonably accessible to, to people who are not specialists in the field. And to that end, there's a fairly extensive set of help available online and inside the application. And that explains the, the underlying concepts of, of acoustics. Uh, there's a discussion forum where I and, and others provide support and advice for people who are trying to use the software. And it does get widely used by audio hobbyists um, looking to optimize their, their home theaters or their hi-fi, but it is also used by acoustic professionals, equipment manufacturers, car manufacturers. It's fairly widely used in education as far as I can tell. Um, I think probably you can't beat the price point in, in that environment. Uh, NASA do have a use for it. I have no idea what they're doing with it. I only know they use it because they send me an email every year confirming that uh, I'm not in the pay of a foreign government and trying to undermine their rockets through my acoustic software. And it's, it's unexpectedly popular. There are about 25,000 downloads a month. Um, I, I'm quite surprised by that, frankly, given that it's a bit of relatively esoteric audio measurement software, but I'm also quite encouraged. I think it's, it's good to, to see that more people are interested in, in measuring things and measuring their acoustic environment. I think that's a, a good uh, trend for all of us. Um, there was a question about the EQ side on mini DSP EQ interfacing. Um, so mini DSP, a, a company in, in Hong Kong, uh, run by Tony Rouget, a Frenchman. Um, I, I used to travel to China fairly regularly and when I was doing some of the consumer electronics work and uh, I had some contact with Tony through the EQ aspects of REW. And essentially you can generate the bi-quad coefficients for some of the filters and write them to a text file and mini DSP can then load that text file in and apply filters using it. Um, 
that's about it really for the, the EQ interface thing. I mean, there, there, there are, um, in some cases, there are a couple of equalizers that you can send um, parameters through over, over MIDI. Um, it really varies by the product. So next up, how did REW come about? Yeah, that, that's a question I often ask myself. Um, so it, it's, it's one of these spare time things. Spare time seems to be something that, that you think you have right up until you try and find some and then you discover actually perhaps you didn't after all. And to give you some of the history to that, back, back in the 90s, I used to work for uh, the Tag McLaren Formula One team in their, their motorsport electronics division. So working on engine management systems, gearbox controls, chassis controls, telemetry, data analysis, sensors, all that kind of thing. Um, at the end, I was, I was the technical director there. And towards the end of the 90s, McLaren had the idea that their, their brand name might find favor in other uh, avenues. And so they decided to set up a, an audio company, audio and home theater equipment. And that was Tag McLaren Audio. Um, actually originally set up through the acquisition of Cambridge Systems Technology who made the Audio Lab range of products. And that had been going for oh, about 18 months or so when, when Udo is the chief exec of both that and, and the motorsport electronics company asked if I would move across there to help him as technical director on that side, which I, I duly did. And the, the AV processes we produced at, at TMA had EQ filters in them. And we came up with a admittedly relatively primitive, primitive way of configuring those where the, the processor would generate a, a slowly progressing sweep. And you could sit there and listen to that. And when it seemed like the sound was getting a bit louder than you'd like, you could pause the sweep and try applying a filter and go back and forth and see whether that seemed to have evened things out a bit um, and move on to the next one. Uh, it was all relatively tedious, I must admit, to, to do, um, but it was quite effective. But I did think we could probably do something a little bit better than, than that. And I, I proposed that we have a system that would take an actual measurement of the room and then work out what the filter should be and just send them directly to the equalizer. And uh, everyone thought, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. However, all our software guys were completely tied up with work on our, our processors. So essentially there wasn't anyone available to do it. And that's when the, the mythical spare time entered my head and I thought, well, yeah, maybe I should do something in the evenings. Uh, one of the benefits of, of being in the audio company compared to the motorsport side was you actually had evenings. Um, on the motorsport side, a good day was when you went home the, the same day you arrived. Whereas in the audio company, most evenings I was able to go home. So it was good to have something to work on. And I think also that's, it, you tend to find that the further you progress in, a, in a, an engineering career, the less engineering you actually get to do. So it's nice to have a, a hands-on project to remind yourself of what it actually means to be an engineer and also to avoid complete brain atrophy or management as it's more properly called. So what happened next? Well. I, I, I dug out a, a spreadsheet. We used a, a bit of an unusual spreadsheet at the time, Quattro Pro it was called, um, I think because we had a, an allergy to, to Microsoft. Um, and that had a macro language and I managed to knock up something that would work out EQ parameters from an imported measurement. Um, not exactly consumer friendly, mind you. Uh, so we had to look at what, what could I do that would be a bit more broadly useful. So. I thought I'd make a Java application. Um, I'd never used Java, but I'd never used any object-oriented language. And that seemed like a good opportunity to learn something new. And uh, the whole cross-platform nature of the Java runtime environment was quite appealing. I didn't really want to be restricted to one particular platform. And so I did, in the end, knock something up in the evenings. And that was what was called Tamrec Wizard, um, which would import measurement data produced by something else um, and work out filters and then send them over a serial link to our processors. Uh, and that was good. It was 2003 we did that. Um, unfortunately, in 2004, um, McLaren decided that, you know what, maybe this audio thing is a bit more trouble than it's worth. 
and perhaps we should get back to the motorsport side of things and, and our road cars. And they sold off TMA and its intellectual property to IAG, um, sold the, the shiny new factory we built to Meridian and said, thanks very much, John, and good luck for the future. So I, I found myself with a bit of spare time and I thought, okay, while I look for a new job, what shall I do to keep myself entertained? So maybe I can do something a bit more with that uh, EQ wizard thing and, and add some measurement capabilities. And so I decided to call it Room EQ Wizard, a, a decision I've come to regret, frankly. I mean, it was appropriate at the time, but perhaps less so as time has gone on. But, but that was how um, REW started up. So the, the evolution of that. So the, the measurement in that first version was, was relatively primitive. It used step sign and Gertzel filters, which are a form of recursive single point FFT effectively to pull out the fundamental and um, a couple of the harmonics and produce a simplified plot of what the response would be. And that was in part reflective of the, the somewhat limited processing capabilities that were available at the time compared to what we have now. Uh, it wasn't quite so straightforward to be running massive FFTs uh, without everything grinding to a halt. However, I did continue to develop it and uh, a year or so later added Exponential Sign Suite, which certainly was a, a big improvement. And it was around 2007 that I moved focus from sort of the EQ side of things more onto the measurement side of things. Um, the Spectrum Analyzer came along a year later and that was when more of the acoustic measurements started to, to become part of the product. So the RT60 graphs and so on. And it's, it's carried on sort of since really, um, alongside full-time jobs up until the end of 2018, where I, I decided to give up on full-time employment. And so I actually did have some spare time then, so I could do a bit more work on REW. So that's where we got more of it. And then last year, this pro upgrade came. And uh, that was another thing with Mini DSP, actually. They'd produced a multi-mic system for a, an automotive manufacturer, um, but didn't really have any, or let's say, affordable uh, multi-input system that could capture the data from it. So Tony asked if I could look at something like that for REW, and, and that's where the pro upgrade arrived. And, oh, some of the challenges, yeah. It, you'll be shocked to hear that it wasn't all plain sailing in producing the, the software, but, but it was uh, interesting and enjoyable along the way. Uh, Java is, is a very good uh, language for this kind of thing. It's good for, for user interface development. Um, it's a little bit primitive in the components, but it's so flexible you can make any kind of component you want, essentially. Um, but at, at the time, so this is back early 2000s, there weren't that much in the way of libraries that you could use. So um, I thought I'd just find a plotting library and be able to do that for, for getting the graphs. Um, the ones I found didn't even understand what a log access was, and they didn't have any concept really of, of data reduction you need to do for plotting. Um, by which I mean, if you look at the, the width of one pixel on a frequency response plot at the upper end of the plot, that can be hundreds of FFT points. And you can't just pick one in the middle and, and plot that because every time you move or, or zoom the graph, the, the plot's going to change completely. So you need to condense that set of values into something. Um, I find the, the min and the max and, and plot that. Um, there also don't seem to be any libraries, uh, perhaps there are now, but at the time there weren't that could deal with the business of extracting the values of acoustic parameters. Um, so I had to come up with that. And there weren't even very many mathematical or scientific libraries. It was, it was 2007, there was the first FFT library. So I ended up having to port a lot of things from other languages, um, mostly Fortran, C, C++, um, or, or just write them from scratch. Um, audio support, that, that's been a bit mixed. Um, it's better nowadays. It was, it was quite poor at the beginning especially on Windows, where it's still relatively poor using the native capabilities of Java. Um, fortunately, there's, there's ASIO driver support for Windows, so that works a great deal better. Um, 
and that, that meant uh, having a third party solution to support that. On Mac OS and Linux, actually Java Sound uh, works pretty well. But I am doing some work with a, a guy called Pavel Hoffman at the moment to improve both the Linux and Windows audio side of things. So Pavel's going to provide a driver that accesses Wasapi exclusive on Windows and the uh, Alsa PCM drivers on Linux. Um, and that's looking quite promising. It's progressing quite well. Next up, standards. Yeah, um, I, I put a big caveat at the top of this slide because probably it's not fair to criticize standards. Um, and it might just be that everything I really wanted to know is there somewhere and, and I'm just not looking in the right places. I kind of thought that anything I wanted to do on the acoustic analysis or, or audio analysis side of things would be embedded in a standard somewhere. And all I had to do was basically sign up to the AES, read the standard and away I'd go. Um, it, it turned out not to be quite that straightforward. Um, and I was somewhat surprised to find that fairly basic things, and I've picked on smoothing there, don't seem to be standardized at all. <clears throat> and I, I don't know how often you encounter a frequency response graph that doesn't have smoothing applied to it. So you'd think that by now, there'd be a way of saying, this is how, for example, you wanna do a third octave smoothing. It should look like this, it should have this kernel, here's how you should implement it. And here's how you make sure that your version of third octave smoothing is the same as someone else's version of third octave smoothing. But, but that doesn't exist as far as I can tell. Um, if someone does know of that, then by all means, put something in the, in the chat box and I'll, I'll go and investigate. Um, and it, if you look further at the, the implementations, you get anything from a simple moving average um, where the, the width of the average depends on the octo fraction at the particular frequency um, through to, uh, if you like, more detailed kernels applied in, in the frequency domain. Um, moving average is, is pretty poor, frankly. It's essentially smoothing as low-pass filtering the particular data series. A moving average is a very poor low-pass filter. You can improve on that by doing multiple passes of the, the moving average. Um, as you do that, you get ever closer to a, a Gaussian response, essentially. But it's, it's still not terribly efficient as an implementation. Um, what I've ended up doing in REW is actually uh, forward and backward passes of uh, a first order IR filter where I adjust the cutoff of the filter according to the frequency. And that is fast and efficient and works pretty well. Um, and the, the aim, because I couldn't find any standard for smoothing, I decided Gaussian would, would be a sensible response. So it aims to do a, implement a Gaussian smoothing curve. Uh, on the measurement side, that I think that there's a lot more in the way of standards there, but they're not always all we might like them to be. Um, I've picked a little bit on the, the AES 17 standard for digital audio equipment there with the standard notch filter, mainly because it has standard in the name, um, perhaps slightly unfair of me, but this standard notch filter can be who knows what order, who knows what shape, and have a bandwidth that ranges over a factor of 2.5. And that just doesn't seem terribly standard to me. And I, I guess part of the problem with measurement standards is a lot of measurement equipment has existed. You can't really come along and say, by the way, I've now made a standard and therefore your equipment is obsolete. And so I suppose the, the equipment can drive the standards to some extent. But in some instances, and I think the notch filter is one of them, that your choices for the parameters of that notch filter will affect your THD plus N measurement. And so what you end up with is a, a result that will be equipment dependent. And I don't think that's really a, a good situation to be in. It would be better if the, the shape of something had an effect on the result, then you should say what that shape should be and have some um, theoretical basis for why it should have that shape. And I think uh, another problem I'd, I'd say with standards is that 
it isn't often that you'll find reference data to say, okay, here's the standard. And if you've implemented it properly, then if you put this data in, this is the data you should get out. And perhaps that's from the perspective of a, an implementer of, of systems. But I think it would help to make sure that what people produce is what the standard was expecting them to produce. Okay, that's enough moaning about standards. Sorry about that. But uh, <clears throat> I'm sure no one ever complains about standards, so I thought I'd have a shot. What's next? Well, um, there is a feature request list. As you can see, there are nearly 600 entries on it at the moment. There have been more than 500 for quite a while, but it's not that they're the same 500. I, I keep knocking them off and others keep getting added on. Um, measurement stimuli are, are very much on the list. So noise is a, a measurement stimulus. Um, the M noise that was mentioned earlier is, is something that's being considered. Speech transmission index, certainly that gets um, requested. And I've, I've been looking at it. There doesn't seem to be entire consensus on the right way to go about measuring that. Um, I'd prefer something that's derived from the impulse response. So I think I'll go that route, but I'm certainly interested in opinions about what's right and wrong about how to make the speech transmission index and make it useful. Uh, I did get a request for wow and flutter recently. It's still, still something that people want. Um, and actually that whole business of FM demodulation is a, a little interesting topic on its own. That's partly why REW has a frequency meter now, actually you need a, a good average frequency. So I thought I'd, I'd pop that in, but I'm not sure when or if I'll get around to implementing wow and flutter measurement. Um, there is something called fast subband adaptive filtering, which looks quite interesting for uh, evaluating the nonlinear performance of a loudspeaker, for example, under the, a stimulus that's completely representative of its normal use. So like a piece of music, um, uh, someone's done a, a toolbox, uh, a MATLAB toolbox, which implements that. And, and that looks quite intriguing although that would probably be a, a big porting exercise. And I, I mentioned, um, well, on the slide there and previously that uh, the idea is that REW is accessible to quite a wide range of users, but you do get a steady accumulation of features and complexity. So I think there's probably a place for a, a way of limiting the interface so that it has a, a subset of the various things that are possible. and that might make it a little bit more um, friendly for people who don't need all, the, all of the detail and just have a few specific tasks they want to uh, accomplish. So I'm thinking about that, but I, I'm generally open to suggestions on things. I, I try to make REW something that is convenient and, and easy to use. And it's really only from actually using it and saying, you know, I, I wish it didn't do that, or I wish that this feature was available that you get a the, some of the more valuable feedback on, on how to make it a better tool. And I think that's me. I've come to the end. Um, I Honestly, John, I don't know how you find time to talk to AES Melbourne, but I'm extremely pleased you do. You seem to have a heck of a lot of stuff on there. But thanks very much, and I'm sure the members do. As any general discussion, did you ever contemplate heading down the path of um, MATLAB style toolboxes and a base uh, program set? Or is um, that, that's what you're contemplating now? Uh, no, no, I've, I've not been down that route. I think there are some. Um, I'm pretty sure I encountered something at one time many, many years ago now. But uh, I think the problem is that although MATLAB is something that, you know, as, as a, an audio professional, you might have regular access to, um, most people don't. <clears throat> and although there are more uh, accessible versions like Octave, it's still, I think, quite a barrier for the, the more novice user to overcome. So I think it, generally it's probably better to have a standalone application and, and try and accommodate people that way. Sure, but the style of a series of toolboxes plus the base program structure. Oh, I see what you mean. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I misunderstood what okay. you were saying. That's okay, I, I, have yeah. trouble, I have trouble with MATLAB licensing too, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
No, no, that that's exactly what I've been thinking of. I'm, I mean, there are a few specific tasks you might want to accomplish. You know, whether it's measure an impedance or measure a loudspeaker yeah, or, yeah, yeah. or room response, and and so you could say up front, okay, this is what I want to do. Show me the things that are relevant to that, and just hide all the rest for me. And and that's what I'm mulling over by way of having some sort of user and task specific configuration. John. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm having a great deal of fun playing with your software and learning all the time. So please don't reduce all of the features or if you hide them, don't make them go away completely. I, I'll, I'll try not to. Yes. <laughs> As a user. They, they were hard one, most of them. So I'd, I'd be reluctant to chop them out. I, I love the software. It's beautiful. Oh, it's very kind of you to say so. Yes, most certainly. Did you ever look at uh, some of the distributed parameter models for a series of wave reflections or room analysis or mapping between acoustic, electrical and mechanical domains, that sort of thing? Um, yes and no. I, I think on the simulator side of things, it's interesting and it's a useful starting point, but unless you're going to go all the way to finite element and a detailed architectural model of the space, it can be a little bit limited in, in what it tells you. Um, and, and when you measure things are never quite, as you think, your know, rooms are never quite the dimensions they're supposed to have, the walls aren't quite parallel, the, the materials are, are somewhat variable. And it makes it a little bit more difficult to generalize that but it is something to to look at could be a topic the, for discussion oh so joe's got a lot of questions before joe jumps in um i was asked if there's a particular usb mic recommended um one of the first ones i came across was was mini dsp they've got a umic one and a, a higher performance umic two uh, either of them works fine but they've got the benefit of um, a sensitivity figure inside the CAL file, which REW understands, so you can use it as a, an SPL meter as well as a microphone. Um, there, there are compromises with USB mics. Uh, the, the difficulty of having a, a completely reliable timing reference is one of them, which the, the acoustic timing reference tries to get around um, and, and works pretty well for the, the most part. But if you have a, an environment with a lot of very strong reflections, like a the cabin of a, a vehicle, for example, then acoustic timing is probably not going to work well. Sorry, that's that's my front door. <laughs> I'll have to ignore it. Um, the neighbours so, are complaining, are they? <laughs> <laughs> who knows? Um, Joe, what, what questions did you have? Thank you. Uh, one comment about the mini DSP mics. Um, I got one started using it for a completely different transient and stopped using it straight away because I was looking at transient. I suspect it's got two elements, one behind each other, 22 mils apart, which gives you a good, is a directivity. It's a way to get directivity of microphone. So just be careful. I mean, it's totally appropriate if you're, you know, if you want to measure what's coming in that direction, but because I'm much more in the rooms, I um, I want unbiased directionality in the mic. Look, I'm I'm a professional right in the middle of designing stuff now. Decided to bring measurement in house at the end of last year. We did a survey, saw REW looked great. You have used it, and I'm totally delighted with it. And for me as a professional, I had to build confidence that a flat measurement. Was it was a flat loudspeaker? So on mics, I use a Dayton a Dayton audio mic XLR with a calibration file. Totally happy with that. And if I was a little bit together, I'd actually have a measurement to bring up on the screen. But I and I've got plenty of DSP, and I get I try to EQ to say plus or minus two dB above a thousand hertz. Below a thousand hertz, my question is. I've had to take time to build confidence in what the measurement's telling me. That um, 
because I'm trained in architectural acoustics as well. Um, you know, what's room, what is loudspeaker? And reverberation, which is always worse than the bass, will add sound pressure level. So I'm really interested in fast sweep versus slow sweep. Um, how do you get accurate bass measurements? How, how do you prescribe getting a really accurate bass measurement with not so much room influence on it? Okay, um, just on the, on the mic side of things, just to deal with that initially, uh, it is intended to be an omnidirectional mic actually, so, so something a little bit strange there, but... but yeah, I just got very side. different transients, which... Um, so for, for the room measurement, um, there's sometimes a bit of a misconception that the sweeps move too fast to capture the, the buildup of low frequency resonances and things. Um, I, I think that's a, a misunderstanding of, of what a sweep is doing, actually. The, the sweep is a stimulus, and the room will respond to that stimulus according to its, its characteristics. And as long as you don't stop the capture too soon, then you will capture all of the low-frequency resonant behavior of that space. And, and so everything will be there. Now, now there are um, caveats to that. If you're in a very large space and you use a very short sweep, then you'll probably run into a problem. You really want to use something that's probably a bit longer than the RT60 time of the space. Um, but th there's no difficulty with actually capturing the low frequency response. If you want to separate the, the room's uh, behavior from the, the loudspeaker's behavior, then uh, you can window, of course, to get a, a better view of the, the loudspeaker response, but then you're restricted in frequency resolution by your windowing you're probably best making a close mic measurement of the speaker itself to understand where its limitations are, and then look at the overall response of the room to, to see what that's doing, um, which will generally be a lot. And the, the frequency response is, is the, the best guide probably to, to what's happening. Um, I mentioned that I, I got a bit carried away with, with modal resonance analysis back in the, the mid 2000s. Um, and that's partly because if there is a specific resonance, then you can actually um, take a, a second order filter, adjust the parameters so that the zeros sit straight on the pole of the resonance and it essentially disappears completely and you're just left with the decay of the filter itself, which as long as it's a cut filter will be much faster than the thing it's, it's cancelling. Um, in practice though, I think some of the more recent Studies on that front suggest that we're a lot more sensitive to those imbalances in the frequency response than we are to the actual extended decay of the resonance, um, particularly at the lowest frequencies where it, it seems it's almost impossible to hear the decay itself absent a, a peak in the response. So uh, tackling the, the frequency response itself is, is generally the main thing you need to do. Um. One little thing that I need at the moment, um, which I want to throw at you, because I have to find some somewhere is my old oscilloscope where I had a big dial and I could just go like that and find a problematic frequency because you're doing a design, everything is measuring well, you're playing it, but something's barking and you want to find mm. that because you want to pull a little bit of energy out. And you mentioned earlier how you originally had a, a slow sweep when you thought something sounded wrong, you stopped, and get, that gave you the frequency. So is so, there some idea of having a simple, you know, forensic sweep that you could go and find a frequency and give there you is. a clue? Yeah. There is? Um, yeah. If, if you uh, look on the, the tone generator, there's a little box on there called Frequency Follows Cursor. And if you select that, okay. then you can move the cursor on the graph, and that's the frequency you get out of the generator. So you can just... Sweep back and forth, stop, start. Perfect. It's for exactly that purpose. Perfect. I look, my other 2000 questions, I might just email to you. <laughs> okay. So, everyone. But I say um, my confidence, my professional um, confidence in the tool is, abs is absolute. And it took me all year to get to that point to say, okay, a flat measurement with this tool is indeed. Short of going to any code chambers and all the all the rest of it, um, the best system that I've come across in that respect, and the price is fantastic. 
Yes, yeah, you can't argue with the price. <laughs> Um, a couple of other questions on the chat. Um, an ability to semi-automate, block the start, stop, and level. Um, uh, in a sense, yes. I mean, automation is one of those many things on the on the to-do list. But you can, in, in the measurement dialogue, you set the start frequency you want, you set the stop frequency you want, um, you set the level you want to make the measurement at. There's then an option to do multiple measurements. So you could say, okay, I want to do 10 measurements, kick the start button. Uh, you get a separate dialogue up, which says which measurement you're making. There's a big pause button on it. You can tap if you want to uh, adjust something like change the angle of a, a turntable or something like that. And then it will just do another measurement, capture that and so on and work through them. And you can configure a delay between each of the measurements if you want. So. Hopefully that's what you were thinking about, but if not, then, then let me know. Um, can you export the spectrogram measurement? No, I'm sorry. Um, you can't do that. I suppose that's another thing for the to-do list. Um, for which use cases would you recommend hardware-based systems like uh, AP and Road and Schwartz and the like? <clears throat> I think if you need for example, um, an absolute value for a frequency. So I mentioned REW has got a frequency meter and it will show you the frequency with quite high precision, uh, about a hundredth of a hertz. But the accuracy of that figure is basically down to the sample clock inside the particular sound card you've got. And I think what you, what you get when you pay the considerable sums you pay for a piece of test equipment is uh, calibration against references so that you know that if it says that's 997 hertz, that is exactly what it is because I've got an oven controlled TCXO in there and that is the frequency it's going to operate at. And, and so I think those are the kinds of situations where um, it, can, it can be valuable to do that. And you know there are other capabilities which having control over the hardware um, you can achieve which you can't um, when you're just using an off-the-shelf interface. And one of the examples would be um, a system like the AP will notch out the fundamentals so that when it looks at analyzing noise and distortion, it's essentially sending a lower level signal to the ADC. And so it makes better use of the dynamic range of the ADC. When you're capturing the whole signal, including the fundamental, then you're a little bit limited by that. Um, however, the performance of some of the modern ADCs is frankly astonishing. And some of the most recent are actually coming close to matching the performance of, of the APs without those measures. So uh, you are getting steady improvements, but you know that there are gold standards and everything. And I think you know, things like the AP are, are certainly gold standards. Um, I had a question about what microphone I recommend for room measurement and what speaker. <clears throat> um, I don't have any particular recommendation on microphones. There are a lot of, of dedicated measurement mics out there. You know, and on, on the top end, Earthworks do some very fine pieces of equipment, but you're spending many hundreds of dollars for the most part. Uh, at the bottom end, uh, a, a Behringer ECM 8000 will do a reasonable job, particularly if what you're interested in is decay times rather than the absolute frequency response. Um, speakers for room measurement. If you're trying to optimize your own studio space, then use the speakers you've got. If you're making uh, acoustic measurements as a you know an acoustic professional trying to characterize a space, then you may need a uh, uh, a dodecahedron or uh, some other form of omnidirectional speaker or something with reasonably wide range and go through a range of different angles. And it depends on you know, how large the space is and, and what it is you're trying to capture about that space. Again, for a studio, you can get good results by putting the speakers in their normal positions and using those. Uh, is there a way to display a pre-ringing effect on the spectrogram view? The, yeah, so the spectrogram generates from the peak, but you can see before and after the peak. 
and that will show you some pre-ringing. Um, you can also see that directly on the impulse response, of course, and just, just look at it there. And if you use the wavelet view, then you can see reflections before and after within the data as well. Uh, Mike, Mike yeah. Roberts. Yeah, good. Hi, John. Can I ask a, a question? I, I'm interested in in the DSP EQ section of your your program. I don't have problems with measurement, but my my issue is that uh, I want to find or optimize to a target response. So when I use your EQ section with low pass, high pass and shelving filters, and when I manually adjust those, and then I actually uh, use the target option to optimize, it drops off all the, the shelving filters and just gives to me uh, basically the peaking components only. Am I doing something wrong? That's one question. But the other one is, um, if I want to Im export the impulse response, say into another program and use an optimizer such as FIR Designer or Sigma Studio, and I Im export the impulse response after it's windowed, uh, so I've removed the reflections, um, does the exported impulse response contain my calibration correction or is that done later in the software? And is the timing correct if I export, say, the tweeter section and the woofer section um, and also have an issue with the exported amplitude? Is that actually scaled uh, to the level or is the scaling between the tweeter, the measured tweeter and woofer response when it's exported still in the same scale? In other words, there's no uh, normalisation of the amplitude. Okay, um, you may need to repeat some of those in a second, but <laughs> let, let's deal with the, the first one. Uh, are you doing something wrong on the um, EQ selection? Uh, yes. So on, on the left side, you'll, you'll find a column called control and filters are normally set to automatic. So if it says, says auto in there, then REW says, great, that's a filter I can use. But you can also set it to manual. And if it's manual, then REW will leave it alone. So when you set your shelf filters and things, then make sure the control is set to manual for those and they'll be used as is. Wonderful, okay. Now on the export side, um, th there are a few things there. Um, your first question was? My first question was, uh, is the my kelp uh, right. color um, the impulse, or is that done later in the software? In other words, so, does the exported impulse response contain uh, all the corrections in the measurement, like the MyCal and and mm -hmm. um, the actual system Cal? Um, and short answer is no, but it can. Um, uh, REW by default keeps the Cal files separate and captures the impulse response without the cal file influences. And primarily that's so that you can easily change it afterwards. So you decide actually that was the wrong mic cal or that was the wrong sound card cal, you can just change it for another one. Yes. Um, but there is, and it's relatively recent, um, last few weeks really, uh, an option to merge the cal file response with the impulse response now. So you can um, hit a button on the all SPL graph and that will merge the cal and produce a new measurement with an impulse response that contains those corrections. And that way you get everything included. Wonderful. Um, your second question was around well, the amplitudes? It, it asks whether it, you want it exported as a fraction of the full scale value. So if I have measured a two-way system with a tweeter and I export, is the relative levels between a woofer and in the tweeter actually modified when I export? In other words, or are they still in the same DB offset what the difference is? 
Um, they'll stay the same unless you click the box to normalize the export. Right. So, so if you don't normalize, then they'll preserve those absolute levels. But Wonderful. I mean, the levels may be very low though. And depending on the export format, that might be a problem. So it, if you can, then you should export in float to, to make sure okay. that you preserve the resolution. Yeah. And my other question would be, can you recommend, um, you said that I actually use <laughs> your optimizer software for, for optimizing systems. And I find it for, in a full range. And I find it what I measure and what it does is exactly if I actually then implement that design, it's virtually perfect to fractions of a DB. I find it works extremely well. But you said it was not in designed for that. So what would you recommend as the best DSP uh, optimizer software on the market that we, I could import the REWs and optimize a, a two or three-way system? Um so I, I, my my comment about the <clears throat> the frequency range of corrections isn't isn't really about whether a package works well or not. If for the most part, if you make a measurement at a point, you apply a set of filters, the software says, okay, this is what you're going to get. <clears throat> at that point, that is what you'll get. The, the difficulty with the higher frequency stuff is if you move a few centimeters to the left or the right, you're going to have a very different response. You've still got the same filters. Yep. So you're going to get a different, different outcome. Now, you can address that to an extent by being mild with your filtering. So broader filters, more, sure. more tone shaping than anything else. And I think, you know, if anyone has made an attempt to do loads of narrow filters at high frequency, they'll pretty soon discover, no. oh my God, that sounds awful. Uh, <clears throat> and, and quite rightly, and hopefully they'll stop doing that. Um, so I, I think there, there are... Loads of options out there. Um, technically, I think Dirac is is very good, a very sophisticated setup. Um, okay. I'm I'm kind of on the fence about whether it makes an overall improvement For within <clears throat> within an environment. You know, we're, we're so adaptive to to what the sound is like. It, it can be all over the place, and you know, within a, a few minutes, basically, you get used to it. And it sounds fine afterwards. And if, if of course, if you're in music production, that's not a good thing. You know, you need something that is objectively flat, and you can get a, an objective result. If you just want to to have a decent sound or or want the things to sound okay, um, I think you have a lot more leeway than than measurements might suggest. So it is easy to look at the measurement and think, oh crikey, I've I've really got to go to town on this. But in practice, it's it's rarely as as bad as it seems. Thank you. No, well, I, I, thank you so much, John, for your software is just, I find it, uh, I've bought a lot of software for measurement and I have B&K gear and whatever, uh, a lot of them mostly analog now. I've been in the business for over 50 years, so I have a lot of analog gear and uh, it, it sits in the back room with a lot of dust on it now, unfortunately, because uh, it doesn't export to a PC very well and I find that the, the amount of data that you can collect in a short time, you know, with uh, particularly your software. And I do hope that you can find the time to actually implement that, uh, the new AES standard, um, the AES 7522, because um, your CA 210 standard for measuring subwoofers, I think that that's a step forward because now we can actually compare systems uh, with other people. And I think that uh, measuring a loudspeaker maximum linear level using M noise, and I understand the problem there because M noise is licensed to Bayer Audio. Um, but it would be lovely to have people use the same software for comparison because every time, even as an engineer, you take all this care trying to implement a standard. And there's so many rooms for error when you create importer and M noise signal from there. and and then set up all these limits of my, to make sure that the microphone's not overloading. And, and there's so many possibilities for error. And um, I think that if, so, if you could put that into the software, it just makes my job a lot easier and uh, less prone to uh, error. Say, so say please, Mike. 
<laughs> no, please. <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> we've got a, we've got a lot of questions, and I'm sure we could go until two a.m. But uh, maybe a couple more questions. Um, who's got questions? Thanks, Mark. That was good. There was so a question on the chat about uh, testing speech clarity. Um, I mean, I, I can't recommend um, any particular method, frankly. I mean, I, I'm I'm just a, a guy that taps away on a keyboard, and I think you should talk to someone uh, with a bit more detailed knowledge of acoustics for the best way of, of measuring speech clarity. Um, I will be looking at implementing the speech transmission index, but and REW does have the you know the typical C50, C80 clarity measures as part of the impulse response. But to, in, in terms of the process of actually going about setting up an environment to measure that, then I think you should, you should probably ask someone else. In my studies in the masters in acoustics with the architects, the best speech clarity is to have someone down the front read a bunch of words and the room full of people ticking what they think the word is. And that gives you, you know, it's really, the best accuracy of a room is clarity. It's just that a basic intelligibility of humans speaking and humans understanding what they're saying. Yeah. So good, guys. Any more questions? I can only see a third of the people on my screen, so I don't know. Please use the chat. Are we all done? Well, John, I think there's uh, a few emails that might arrive as a result of tonight. Please don't redirect the questions to me. You're doing extremely well. Thank you. Um, tonight, I really am pleased, John, that you took the time to... I don't know how you did in amongst all the things you're doing, all 744-plus things that are now on your list, but I really do thank you. If I can get everybody to unmute so we can get a little bit of personal attention to you for thanking you for coming on tonight. And um, I'm wishing you well because the product's good. Okay, so can you all give... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.